What got you there with got you got you What got you there with Sean Delaney? I'm Sean Delaney, and on this episode of What Got You There, I sit down with former Best Buy CEO Hubert Jolie, and we talk all about what's truly at the heart of leadership, some of the misconceptions and paradigm shifts we need around what real leadership is, how to take a company, turn it around, entrepreneurship, discovering more about yourself, and so much more. So if you're into any of those topics, you'll love this episode with Hubert Jolie. Hubert, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Sean. So good to see you. It's very good to see you. One of those interesting jumping off places for a conversation, I always love hearing about some of the non-negotiables or, or things people do pretty consistently throughout their life. I'm wondering for you, is there anything that you've done pretty much every day that you think had a tremendous impact on, on shaping who you became? Oh, uh, yes, daily habits. There's one daily habit I know I need to do, but I don't do it consistently. So I'll tell you what I know I need to do and what I actually do. So the, 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 the one thing I love doing uh, is the daily examine prayer almost. At the end of the day, uh, reflecting, how did I do today? You know, was there some moments where there was more light and energy in my life? Were there some moments, ah, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, my coach, who wrote this great book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, right? Which, of course, is, uh, you know, fun given your title. Um, talks about daily questions. Did I do my best today? Based on what I'm trying to, to, to accomplish, where I'm trying to make progress, did I do my best to be kind and gentle, for example? Did I do my get best to set goals? And really, at the end of each day, revisit the day. It's hard to do, because as human beings, we need structure. So, so what some of my friends do is they, they call each other to support each other in that process. Uh, what I do, for sure, when I'm not able to do this. Regularly, I try to write my eulogy or a letter of myself 10 years out to my younger self. And uh, you know, congratulating me for everything I've accomplished in the preceding 10 years. And really trying to start with finish, right? Uh, and then regularly with my spouse, uh, we look at this because we have actually a joint document which we're trying to accomplish together. And then revisiting, are we, are we on track with what we're, so in other words, that all of this stems from a single idea, which is we're the captains of our souls. And we are, you know, we are the decision makers of our lives. And this is not about trying to be perfect, but, you know, maybe we'll talk about it, but I think the quest for perfection is evil actually. <laughs> but this is about doing the best we can and being kind with ourselves, but uh, staying focused on our life purpose. So that's a, a routine I like. Hubert, this is fantastic. I, I feel like we could almost spend the, the entire hour on, on this alone. I am curious, though, because you, you mentioned it uh, during those daily reflections, the importance of your energy and your bandwidth. How do you, how do you view that import, importance? And do you factor that in to how you're allocating time on your calendar? Yeah, I think that we, Sean, we really saw this, uh, you know, during this, uh, we're seeing this during this multifaceted crisis. As leaders, we want to do important things in the world and for others. A key reminder is we have to start with ourselves because it's like on the plane when the you know, oxygen mask comes down, we have to put it on ourselves first so that we can help others. So as leaders, taking care of ourselves is so important. What does that mean? It's going to mean something different for every, everybody. So for some people, it's going to be mostly exercise. For me, uh, I try to exercise. I'm also working hard. This is a daily fight for me to set aside some blocks of time that are not booked so that I can breathe. I can spend a bit of time where uh, we're all you know, working from home, spend a bit of time with my wife. I can have time to write, reflect. And then, you know, meditation is so important, whether it's meditation or prayer. So back, you know, at the end of the day, I think the most important time to meditate for some people, it's the beginning of the day. For me, it's at the end of the, of the day. So really taking care of us. So, because one of the things we've learned, Sean, we have learned, and I've, seen, I've been inspired by so many leaders during this uh, multifaceted crisis, we've been trained, many of us, to lead with our brain. You know, being smart was really important. And being the smartest person in the room, that's how many, so many of us grew up. One of the things I've learned is that we need to lead with all of our body parts. This idea of cutting our head from the rest of our body is a terrible idea. And for me, it's been a journey because I grew up, you know, 
like probably every, every one of your listeners, have a lot of wonderful gray cells, but have been over relying for too many years on the gray cells. And I think discovering that we can lead with all of our body parts, our brain, our heart, our soul, our guts, our, of course, our ears, our eyes, our hands. This is really uh, critical because so much about you know, living our life is not so much about being the smartest person in the world. It's about these other body parts. I, I'm so intrigued about this, where, where you've had enough time to be able to reflect and, and analyze a lot of years. Uh, I'm curious, when these ideas really started to take shape for you? It's been a lifelong journey. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I can give you some milestones along the way, right? Uh, um, early 90s, so about 30 years ago, I will always remember a conversation. So I was at McKinsey and Company at the time. We had invited a client, a prospective client to dinner that was in the Paris office. Uh, he was the CEO of a big uh, computer company. And we were trying to pitch him, how can we help you and so forth. And instead he did a lecture for us. He had just come back from a, an offsite with other senior executives, CEOs. And he said, what we've concluded is that uh, you know, the purpose of the corporation is not to make money. Profit is not the goal. It's an outcome. And you have to think in business of three imperatives. The people imperative, having good people on your team who are well-equipped, well-trained, well-motivated. The business imperative, we need to have customers. Uh, and then the financial imperative, uh, which is we need to make money, of course. But the financial imperative, financial performance is more an outcome of performance on the other imperative. So learning how to treat profit as an outcome as opposed to the goal and to reflect on the fact that, you know, what is the purpose of the corporation? Of course, this has become very fashionable now. This was 30 years ago. And, you know, in my view, the purpose of the corporation is to contribute to the common goods. Um, so that was the first reflection. Another milestone, maybe a couple of years later, I had the opportunity um, to write two articles in a philosophy journal and in a theology journal about the philosophy and theology of work. Why do we work? Is work a curse, you know, a punishment because some dude sinned in paradise? Is it something we do so that we can do something else that's more fun? Or is, is, is work really part of our search for meaning as individuals, part of our humanity, part of you know, what gives meaning to our life, and joy to our life. And of course, I believe in the, we were arguing for, you know, the latter. This was an important milestone. Another milestone, because life is not linear. So I think one of the dangers for every leader is to be seduced by power, fame, glory, or money. Big danger. Anytime you feel that this is the driver, it's a timeout. And one day during my career, I volunteered for a job. I was working for a media and entertainment company called Vivendi Universal, you know, Universal Pictures and Music and so forth. And Universal had just been acquired by a French company called Vivendi to form Vivendi Universal. And I volunteered to lead the integration of the two companies. At the time I was the CEO of the video games company of the group that was based in Los Angeles. But I thought, let me go after that job because it's gonna bring me closer to the top. Ego, power, fame, glory. Uh, good news is I was punished <laughs> because the job, had, there was no content. There was no synergies between you know, Vivendi and Universal. So this was a very boring job. Uh, and that was a great punishment and great lesson. So for me, the criteria now, when I think about what job to take or what to do, is I want to always do something that's meaningful, impactful, and joyful. These are the three criteria. Another milestone short, shortly thereafter, so uh, after this integration thing, you know, Vivendi got in trouble, I moved back to Paris, I was part of the team that was uh, restructuring uh, Vivendi Universal. So in many ways, I had gotten to the top of the mountain. You know, I had a very successful career, 12 years with McKinsey, a partner who had led several, you know, divisions or businesses. But then when I reached the top of that first mountain, I felt emptiness. There was nothing. It was not fulfilling. And so this led me, so that you could call this the midlife crisis. I was in my early 40s, right? This led me to want to reflect and, and find a way to decide what I wanted to do with my life. It so happens 
So you're gonna believe I'm very religious. I'm not, but I think spirituality is part of our lives. To do the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. And this was over a two year period of time to revisit my life and try to discern my calling in life. So the meaning of my life. And it helped me define it as uh, try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have to make a positive difference uh, in the world, which is a, an evergreen uh, purpose. Uh, so that was a very important milestone for me. And then, of course, my years at Best Buy were such a source of joy and because I learned so much Sean, about, uh, of course, how to turn around a business. I've, I've done several of those, but more importantly, how to unleash human magic in a large organization by putting a noble purpose as the North Star of the organization and in putting people at the center and learning that the role of the leader is not to be the smartest person in the room, but the role of the leader is to create an environment in which others can blossom. These were some milestones. So many places we, we could go down right now. I, I wanna make sure we revisit those two years of the self-exploration because reading your book, I think that's one of the, the big ahas for me is the amount of work and time and reflection you've put in throughout the years. But, but before we dive into that, I would love diving into human magic and, and people at the center of that. Um, for, for people unfamiliar, can you just give more, more context into human magic and how you approach that? Yeah, I think we have to, to rewind because in many ways, our view of business, Sean, has been influenced by Milton Friedman, you know, who in 1970 wrote that the uh, only the sole purpose of a company was uh, to maximize shareholder value. So it was called, uh, you know, the primacy, the shareholder primacy uh, theory, which has really influenced business around the world for many, many years following his article in the New York Times uh, in 1970. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, a, 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 an excessive focus on profit is dangerous. It's wrong. It leads you to, uh, to do the wrong things. And if you step back and think about, you know, what we just talked about, uh, it leads to why do we work? You know, when, you, uh, when we, <laughs> on the last day of our life, you know, the pride is not going to be what title did I have when I was 45? or what's the size of my banking account? It's gonna be much more profound. I think if you see a company as a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal, then it changes everything about your view of business. Because if it's individuals, human beings, then similarly, the purpose of, of the corporations, as I learned from my client friends, is not to make money, profit is an outcome, and you have to anchor the company in the pursuit of a noble purpose, which is doing something good in the, in the world and then embrace you know, all of the stakeholders, whether it's the employees and the customers and the, part, the vendors, the community, the planet, and the, the shareholders. And that's in a sense, it's a declaration of interdependence. Uh, it's, it's the idea that you can do well by doing good and that pro business is more than for profits. And uh, now most people today believe this, you know, there's been this big movement, the, the business roundtable issued that statement two years ago around the purpose of the corporation and this idea of stakeholder capitalism. The challenge as I certainly experienced and many of my friends in positions of leadership know is that it's easy to articulate, it's really hard to do and to make it come to life. And so back to your question, Sean, about this uh, idea of human magic. I think that I saw that come to life at Best Buy. So in, before I talk to you about the theory, I'll tell you a story. How about that? That'd be great, yeah. Because uh, uh, that's how we learn right, from stories. And that's, that really hit me. So one day there was this uh, mother getting into one of our stores at Best Buy with her young child. And the child had uh, received, had gotten a gift for the holidays, which was a dinosaur toy. Unfortunately big drama, the dinosaur toy, the head was cut off. And so the, the dinosaur was not in great shape. Now, if you go to a normal store, um, you know, maybe somebody will direct you to the toy aisle and uh, with luck, maybe there's still a, a, a dinosaur toy for sale and you can replace it, um, you know, buy a new one or if it's, in, you know, within the return period, maybe you, you, get a, uh, you get a free one. That's not what happened. 
is two associates in the Best Buy store. So what was going on here with this uh, young child? And they went behind a counter, took the dinosaur toy, started to perform a surgical procedure. And for those of us who have been watching Good Doctor on Amazon, uh, walk the child through the steps they were taking in the surgical procedure. Of course, at the last minute, substituted a new one, uh, but gave back a cured dinosaur to the child. And you can imagine the joy, both in the child and his mother. Now, Sean, do you believe there was a standard operating procedure at Best Buy on how to deal with broken dinosaur toys? Do you think there was a memo from me? This is how you shall handle these situations. Of course not. So what happened is that these two associates had it in their hearts to do this. And so when I saw that, I say, my God, this is magical, right? This is completely irrational. This should not be happening. And suddenly at scale, because this was not just one story, but you had these stories across many, many stores. Uh, and so how do you create this uh, environment where uh, human magic can be unleashed? For me, there's several ingredients and that, that's what I learned uh, when I was the CEO uh, of Best Buy. Of course, you know, we had a, we had defined our purpose as a company uh, as being uh, enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs. So we had said, we're not actually a retailer. Uh, we're not even a, you know, certainly a brick and mortar retailer, but we're, we're in the business of touching lives. When in many ways we're in the happiness business. And if you do this, it expands the addressable market, right? Because you can go beyond just selling products. That's how we got into uh, the healthcare business, helping aging seniors stay in their home longer with the help of technology. So we put sensors under their beds, the sofa, the bathroom, the kitchen, fall detection, and you know, with remote monitoring and artificial intelligence in our care centers, we can uh, uh, detect any anomaly and, and then deal with that. So that got us into a new business. We would never have gotten into this business if we had not had this idea of enriching lives. So you have to articulate a purpose, you have to, to create the strategies that underpin this, but then, you know, how do you unleash this human magic? In the old days, so last century, the model was you take a bunch of smart people, they create a smart strategy, a smart implementation plan, they communicate it, big PowerPoints, you put incentives in place and hope that um, something is gonna happen. Eh! <laughs> Usually nothing happens because it's, uh, nobody likes to be told what to do. And financial incentives actually don't do a good job of driving performance. So the, the ingredients of human magic are what? One is to create an environment where you can connect what drives you as an individual with the purpose of the company. So here is a story. Uh, there was, uh, there's a story in, in, in the Boston market. The store general manager would uh, ask every one of the hundred or so associates in the store, what is your dream? Tell me about your dream at Best Buy or outside of Best Buy. Okay, write it down in the break room. And then my, my job is to work with you to help you achieve your dream. There was another moment in our journey at Best Buy where I gathered, every quarter we would gather the executive team, you know, for enough sites. And one time over dinner, I'd ask everyone to bring a picture of themselves when they were two or three or four years old and share with each other their life story and their purpose in life. It changed everything, right? Because we uncovered who, the, who we were truly and what we were trying to accomplish. And then that's how we decided that, you know, this is not just about us as individuals, we can actually create good things in the world through the platform we have. It's about also, that's the second ingredient, creating true human connections within the company. So another story, Sean. Uh, it was a, a, an associate in one of our stores, he, he once shared with me that his life changed the day a manager recognized him and took an interest in him and invested in it. So my compatriot, Rene Descartes of the Cartesian philosophy, uh, you know, said, I think, therefore I am. 
your very brain. Eh, I think he's wrong. <laughs> it's I am seen, therefore I am. If you see me, if you respect me, if you take an interest in me, then I have the opportunity to be to become the best version of myself, right? Autonomy is another factor because nobody likes to be told what to do. So we, at some point, you know, we 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 told people yesterday scripts on how what's the best way to sell a TV. Now we said, use your instinct and connect with the customer as an individual and treat them as a friend. Uh, and and there's a, a couple of others, but. You get the flavor, right? It's to truly create a very human environment where people will do magical things that are completely, you know, from, you look at it from a logical standpoint, it makes no sense, but yet it happens. I love the concept, especially early on in your career, that a lot of times it's just about someone that you look up to, seeing you and just giving you that little bit of boost. I'm wondering for you, was there someone that helped give that little bit of boost for you, that they saw you? Um, I will say, you know, I have a huge debt of gratitude to a number of individuals um, from, from whom I learned. So I don't know that they, no, I think actually they, yeah, they saw me and I certainly learned from them. So I already mentioned the, uh, the client, I mentioned the two monks, Father Martin and Father Samuel. Um, it was another one, I mean, another client, Yves Lesage from, uh, you know, I watched them. That's the fun thing when I was a McKinsey consultant. You know, McKinsey gets paid vast amounts of money from the client. The fun thing is that I was learning from my clients and they were paying me, so go figure. But I could see how he was leading in a very human fashion. So for example, one of the things he told me he would do deliberately, he would arrive at every meeting. That's when we had real meetings in the physical world, uh, five or 10 minutes early so that he could ch chat and speak with the, the meeting participants before the meeting actually started. As opposed to, you know, uh, I am the busy CEO, I arrive at the last minute and we get on with business. So that, I thought that was quite, uh, quite remarkable. Another turning point for me, Sean, was uh, my coach, Marshall Goldsmith, that I mentioned. Um, so he, in his infomercials, I am the before and after you know, picture. Uh, before meeting Marshall, I would have said, if somebody was using a coach, I would have thought, well, what's wrong with that person? Who needs a coach, right? But then I realized I was, you know, I like to play tennis. I'm a skier. When I play tennis, I like to play with a coach because I want to improve my forehand. Or in skiing, I like to ski with an instructor because I want to improve how I ski in the muggles. And so 100% of the top 100 tennis players in the world have a coach. And I think leaders, CEOs uh, and other leaders, we need coaches. We need somebody to help us get better. And this is not this is not something that's remedial. It's how can we get better? And Marshall has got this wonderful process where you know he does a 360. He asks people around you, work for you or your peers or your in my case as a CEO of the board, what am I doing well? What can I get better at? And then what was transformative, he said to me when he was debriefing. You bear, you don't need to do anything, right? It's your choice. And then, but you can ask yourself are, in all of the comments, are there things that I would like to get better at? I say, oh yes, I want to improve my forehand in tennis. And as a CEO, I'd like to get better at these one, two or three things. And then I share that with my team. Thank you for all of the feedback you gave me. That was a gift. I've decided to work on improving my capabilities on number one, number two, number three. And I'm gonna need your help. So I'm gonna follow up with each of you and ask you for advice on how I can get better at these things. And three months from now, I'll follow up with you uh, so that you can tell me how I'm doing and give me more advice. And of course, one of the things that did uh, when I, when I, whenever I've done that is that it signals to the entire team that it's okay to not be perfect and it's okay to try to get better at something. So if you run into somebody from Best Buy, you know, ask them, what are you working on? Bet they're working on something. So these were some people who've uh, really helped me tremendously through my life. No, I absolutely love that mindset. And one of the things that, that I would love to uncover with you, it's obvious the, the amount of work you've done. You were mentioning those two monks. If someone's listening to this, they're saying, I'm trying to uncover who I am or what I want. 
Are, are there any starting places or initial questions they can explore to help lead them yes. down that path? Yes, and I'm gonna actually pull a book. It's right behind me. It's called Aligned, Connecting Your True Self with the Leader You're Meant to Be. It's by Hortense Legentier, who's one of the foremost executive coaches in the world. Oh, she's also my wife, so I'm completely objective. But she's written a year ago this wonderful book and with a foreword by Marshall uh, that has all sorts of uh, practical tools like revisiting your life and then trying to discern at what points in your life did you have more energy and or at what points were you more drained? Uh, what were your childhood, childhood dreams? Uh, who are your heroes and why do you admire them? Um, write your eulogy, which is something I already uh, mentioned. Um, and that's a, these are some tools to help you discern, you know, what's gonna be important to you. Uh, True North by Bill George. Bill George is one of my heroes, a, a great friend, neighbor in Minneapolis, former CEO of Medtronic, has, has written this, this, book, uh, this book called Discover Your True North. And one of the things that Bill highlights is the importance of crucibles in your life. So identifying moments where that were difficult and how you readjusted your life at that moment, took advantage of that. Is a, the last thing I would say, because there's many uh, approaches to this, but another way is the so-called Japanese concept of Ikigai, which is the intersection between four things. Uh, what the world needs, what you're passionate about, what you're good at, and uh, you know, how you can make money, because we don't, do, do need some money, even though it's not the ultimate goal, you do need some money to, uh, uh, to, 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 to make a living. And so at the intersection of these four things, you can uh, discern you know, your calling, your sweet spot, and what you, what you wanna do. If it's only what you're passionate about, but you're not good at it, or the, nobody needs it, or you can, that's not helpful. You know, it may be a passion project, but, uh, and if you're good at it, but you don't enjoy it, that's gonna be draining. So it's finding the intersection. And I think it's tr what's true for the individual can be true for the company. What, are the, what does the world need? What are we passionate about as a team? What are we good at? And how can we make money? These are four good questions to discern your, your purpose as an individual and your purpose as a, as a company as well. Hubert, I'm wondering when you discovered your purpose, has there been moments or times where you've questioned that or has it just been crystal clear since the day you've uncovered it? I think it's, I think life is so much a journey. Yeah. You, you, you write it down and then you step back and look at how is it doing? Is it, you know, and, and there was a, a moment uh, a year or two ago when I decided to pass the baton of CEO uh, uh, of Best Buy to my wonderful successor, Corey Barry. Uh, I, I had to decide what I wanted to do in this next chapter. So it was very clear. I was not moving to Florida to play golf with aging white men because you know, I don't play golf, so why do that? I was not going to be the CEO anymore. And yet I wanted this next chapter to matter. And so I really took a year. I had some strong hypothesis, but still I slowed down and I took time, right? Because if I'm, if I'm going to decide what I'm going to do for the next 20 years, taking uh, six to 12 months to decide this, I think it's okay, right? <laughs> there was no rush. And... Um, I had many, many conversations uh, with friends, people who knew me. I spoke with, I explored a lot of opportunities just to get a sense. And then eventually I went back to what I wanted to do, which was to give back and uh, help the next generation of leaders, uh, which is why I wrote this book, The Heart of Business. This is why I'm teaching at uh, Harvard Business School, because uh, I, I believe that business education needs to evolve so that and, and leadership needs to evolve so that we can tackle the very significant problems that the world is, um, is facing. That's why I'm coaching and mentoring a number of CEOs and senior executives. And so I took the time and regularly, uh, I'm touching base with my coach, I still have a coach, and to check it, and my wife as well. And we're checking in, how am I doing? Does it make sense? Am I, was my hypothesis right? Do I have the energy? Uh, does what I'm doing give me energy? 
it's a good sign when you feel that uh, you know your, your, your drains there's something there's something wrong that you're not aligned uh, whereas when you're full of energy that's something that uh, you know there's something right happening in your life yeah, you, you can uncover a lot during the, those draining times. You've mentioned slowing down and reflecting a few times. You, you mentioned recently when you decided to pass the baton on of Best Buy, taking a longer amount of time. How about someone in the position running a large organization like Best Buy? I'm wondering with the amount of things coming at you day to day, how you took time. I kind of pic picture this as zooming into the details and then being able to zoom out and really reflect. How do you do that as a CEO of a large organization like that? Yeah, and how do you say to stay centered and anchored? So there's many ways. Again, the, the the daily routine we talked about, I think, is a good thing. And then finding times where you can uh, a bit decompress. So uh, in the old days, when uh, you know executives were flying around the world, uh, I loved long flights because there was no email. Now there's Wi-Fi on planes, but uh, there was no emails, no phone calls. And you could spend, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours uh, reading, reflecting, thinking, writing. Uh, some of the best decisions I've made have been made walking by myself around the lake that's just in front of my house in Minneapolis. It's about an hour to go around. And uh, walking can, you know, trigger reflections because uh, you, you need to let people, uh, things sit and emerge. And uh, so walking can be a good, uh, a good movement. Uh, some people focus on, they have their personal board of directors and their, 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 their group of uh, very close friends with whom they can be very uh, transparent. Having a coach has for me been a, uh, uh, you know, a lifeline because that's, uh, uh, that's how you can check in and see how you're doing and, and uh, not losing track because there's many I mentioned power, fame, glory, and money. For, for people in positions of leadership, this is a constant danger. So you have to also protect us. So one trick I use at Best Buy, I told Matt Furman, who still is and was my head of corporate communication, to Matt, your mission is to make sure I am never on the cover of any magazines, right? Because the, the story about Best Buy, it's not about me, right? It's, it's, I want to focus on the work and the people. Of the, and in the danger, if you're on the cover of too many magazines, you start believing your own propaganda. You know, you, you, you believe that you're important. <laughs> and this, this is that, because the biggest danger is our ego, right? Inflated egos are often what get us in trouble. For you, what moments made you start to look at your ego too much? Right, like I, I have to assume we're all susceptible to that, and so I'm wondering how you how you're better attuned to that. If, if those those magazine covers kind of got past um, your officer there, I'm wondering how you handle that. So Matt was actually successful. I was never on the cover of any magazine, with one exception. You know, Barron's magazine made me one of their top 30 CEOs in the world, and uh, Matt refused to give them a picture. But on Barron's, they actually draw people. So, so we had a big laugh. <laughs> Also, there was, a, um, there was a, a moment. So when I became the CEO of Best Buy, Best Buy is a big company and headquartered in Minneapolis. So when I would go out to restaurants and to, I would get recognized. Or when I would go to uh, some of our conferences where we gather all of the store general managers, you know, people would line up to have a selfie with me. And that can be destabilizing, right? But one of my colleagues said, just make peace with it. They, they actually want to do this. So be as gracious as possible. And it's not about you. It's the, you know, they, they like you, but you know, they'll like the next CEO as well. So just, just be nice. <laughs> I, I'm so intrigued by the decision to, to join uh, Best Buy as the CEO, because at that time, a lot of people were saying essentially this was a lost cause. So I, I think about this is decision-making and judgment are just so crucial. I would love to know what your thought process was like uh, upon accepting the role of CEO of Best Buy? So it took me a while <laughs> because when I, and that's how the book opens, right? When, when I got the call from my good friend, Jim Citrin, who is the, the, the senior partner in charge of a lot of the CEO searches at Spencer Stewart. Uh, and I've known Jim, Jim and I have known each other for 30 years. We were together at McKinsey. And so Jim calls me to talk about the CEO job at Best Buy. And I said, Jim, you're crazy. 
I know nothing about retail. And the place is a zoo. You know, they, they're going to be killed by Amazon. Uh, they used to be a great company. I'd known them, you know, when I was in video games. But the quality of service has gone down. You know, the you know the, the, the founder wants to take the company private. I mean, it's it's, and he said, trust me. First, they're not looking for a retailer. Two, you've done turnarounds. You know how to do this. I think it'd be great. So at least do me a favor. Take a look at it. And so I studied, I, I read everything possible about Best Buy. I was a mystery shopper. I listened to all of the previous earnings calls. I uh, spoke with alumni of the organization. Uh, and I developed the view that uh, the world actually needed Best Buy, right? We as customers, for some of our purchases, we need a place where we can see the product and ask questions. And then the vendors also needed Best Buy because they spent billions of dollars on R&D and they need a place where to showcase their product because you know you, you, you have headphones on you, uh, Sean. The only place in the world where you can test headphones is in the real world. You cannot do this you know, online, even with the reviews and so forth. It's not new because you cannot see how it fits and so forth. Same with the picture quality of a TV. And so I felt that the world needed Best Buy and all of the problems the company had were essentially self-inflicted. And so I thought, oh, if it's self-inflicted, then we can correct this because there's nobody else, right? It's just us. And so I developed the point of view that it could be done. And so when the, at the end of the recruiting process, I told the, the board uh, that I actually wanted this job and I had been preparing for this job my entire life. And, and then uh, they gave me, they called me, Kathy Higgins, Victor, who was leading the search committee, called me on my birthday, <laughs> August 11th in 2012. To tell me I had the job. I said, oh, thank you. What are first weeks like there? Right. Like I, I can only imagine there's a bunch of anticipation going on in your head thinking about the role. And then you get there first few weeks. What is that like? So um, based on the great advice from one of my colleagues at Best Buy, I spend the first week on the job working in stores. Uh, and of course, you know, I could read, uh, I could do uh, meetings at headquarters, I could look at spreadsheets, but the intuition was, this is a people business, which is won or lost on the front line. I think it's General Patton who said, uh, you cannot push a noodle, you have to pull a noodle. So he had this vision of leading from the front. I'm not saying that Best Buy was a noodle, but I think you get the, <laughs> the point. And Sean, I learned so much during that first week, which I would never have learned in headquarters. So I was able to spend time in the store, watch the interactions between the blue shirts, the Best Buy blue shirt, the salespeople and the customers, really study the phenomenon of uh, showrooming, people coming to our store, speaking with our associates and leaving empty handed, maybe to buy online cheaper. Also, so I did focus group with the associates and one of them said, Uber, do you know that the search engine on the site is not working? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, type Cinderella, you'll get Nikon cameras. I know it rhymes, but it's not quite the same. And do you think anybody at headquarters would have told me that? Of course not. And uh, also they were furious in the stores because the board, for maybe good reasons, they had given large stay bonuses to the senior executives while the board was doing the CEO search. But at the same time, the management team had reduced the employee discount. And many people working in the stores at Best Buy, they love consumer electronics and they enjoy the discount. So this is, so this is crazy, right? And so it was so important for them. And so in many ways, uh, the, the, I learned things that then we were able to act upon. So one of the principles back to this idea of people at the center, you know, in a turnaround, certainly in our case at Best Buy, people were telling me, but you're going to have to cut, 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 close down stores, cut headcounts. We did the opposite. We thought that people were not the problem. People are the source of the solution. So we started by listening to the frontliners. I started by rebuilding the team at the top because I'm a bit of a Maoist. I believe that fish rot from the head and you have to fix the team at the top. In, when we looked at improving performance, we first focused on how do we grow the revenue? So that's how we decided to match 
online prices so that we wouldn't you know, lose customers because of price. That's why we decided to invest in the customer experience online and in the stores. We also knew that we needed to cut costs, but we didn't start with headcount. We first focused on the majority of the cost reduction efforts were focused on reducing what I call non-salary expenses. So everything in the cost structure that's not related to people. So let me give you an example. So at Best Buy, do we sell a lot of TVs? Yes, we do. They are big and they're thin, so they break. Every year at Best Buy at the time, we would break roughly $200 million worth of TVs every year. That's a large number. If you can reduce what we call TV junk out by improving packaging or the design of the TVs or how they're handled throughout, let's say by 50%, you save $100 million. And it's good for the customer because believe me, no customer wants to buy a broken TV and it's good for our PNL. And you only get to headcount as a last resort. So if revenue growth plus reduction of non-salary expenses is not sufficient, sometimes you may have to go after headcount, but then you still do it in a way, you know, there's turnover in companies so you can redeploy people. You try, these are part of members of the family who've got skills and experience. You try to uh, maybe eliminate the position, but keep the people in, and move them to different places. And then it was all about uh, unleashing this energy uh, at, the, at the company. And so it was not cut, cut, cut. And it all started because I spent the first week working in stores, learning from the frontliners. Well, I love that you bring to light a lot of these misconceptions around leadership. We, we think it's the person in the ivory tower. They, they have no time for anyone. They're up there. And that's just not true. Uh, if you want really great leadership, um, and, and so it's great hearing people who are actually in the arena, on the front lines, actually bringing this to light. I, I am really intrigued, um, bringing the power of the people you have, unleashing them even more. When you brought on new upper management, are there things you did to help unleash those people even more? I know you mentioned the amount you worked on yourself. How do you get those other people within the organization to unleash themselves as well? Yeah, that's something also I, in, in my life journey, I learned a lot. Initially, earlier in my career, I would put a lot of emphasis on recruiting for experience and expertise. I wanted to, to have the best e-commerce person or the best marketing person. And experience and expertise are not unimportant, but gradually over time, I say to put more emphasis on the individual and who they are, what kind of leader they are. I remember I was um, in 2007, I was being interviewed by Marilyn Carlson Nelson, the daughter of the founder of Carlson Companies, to be your successor as the CEO of Carlson, the first non-family uh, uh, CEO of that uh, company. And this was on our plane flying back from Paris to Minneapolis. We'd gone to, to watch the, the, rugby, the final of the Rugby World Cup in Paris. And so I had an eight hour interview on our plane. <laughs> One of the questions she asked me is, Hubert, tell me about your soul, right? Who asked this question? And, and yet, you know, in, in the most important decision, one of the most important decisions we make is, who do we put in positions of leadership? Wouldn't you like to know that the person in charge has a good soul and is gonna have an orientation of their leadership to help others before they help themselves? That's critical. So a key question I ask in, interview, in interviews now is, what drives you? What's your dream? What's your leadership philosophy? Uh, I don't always ask the question about what's your soul, it depends a little bit on the circumstances, but put a lot of emphasis on that. So that was a, a, an important uh, turning point for me. The other one, uh, probably around 2017 at the, at the company. So we had completed the turnaround and we were focused on how do we accelerate the growth of the company? How, what, how do we create a company that we can all be very, very proud of? And during the turnaround, arguably, you know, the, the, the turnaround when the ship is sinking, you have to be, as the CEO, you have to be very decisive. And so a lot of decisions came to me. But with the size of Best Buy, if all of the decisions we make have to come to me, we're not going to do much, right? Because I only have, <laughs> even if I work hard. And so a turning point was to, have a conversation within our team around decision-making. And uh, we had somebody help us with that because it was, it was, we were stuck. 
And so you know, they had me say, okay, Hubert, what are the decisions where you're responsible? I said, well, there's very few. You know, the big strategy of the company, who is on the team, our values, maybe the big investment decisions like acquisitions or if we're going to spend $100 million on an IT project. But that's it. Now, there are other areas where I may want to be able to give my point of view. So if you're in charge of it, please consult me. But you're in charge. And then we try to say, okay, what are all of the decisions typically we have to make? How can we push them down as far down as possible? And how can we be clear about how we make the, uh, how the individual in charge of that decision makes the decision? Is it a, an autocratic decision where, you know, brushing their teeth, they, they, they decide or do they consult? Does it need to be unanimous? Does it need to be the majority? Let's be clear about this. Most often it's gonna be consultative. You know, the person will consult with people who may have a say, uh, but that doesn't mean people who are consulted have a veto right, because where we were stuck is that if somebody, if Jack would say, I would do it this way, and then Mary would say, I would do it that way, the person in charge of the decision would be like, you guys need to align. And the answer is no. Take the input and you are empowered and whatever decision you make will support you. And so that unglued and debottleneck the organization and allowed us to, and now with, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners there in agile teams, you know, there's a different way of working where things don't need to go to the top and it's agile teams working quickly in sprints who make the decisions and, and move things forward. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, Decision-making is something I, I'm always thinking about. So you better thank you for, for shedding light on that. W one of the things you, you bring up a lot in the book, and that's around being authentic. And I would love to know if you have any examples that would be you being authentic, but that would go against traditional standards, right? Like we were talking about leadership and, and what we think that is. Any other clear examples uh, of you being your authentic self that might go against the grain slightly? Yes, uh, the leadership model of the last century was the leader as the superhero who saves the day because they're the smartest, right? And who are mainly driven by their own ego. That was last century. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> the others do. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> eh, that doesn't work anymore. You know, we're, we're, I think the new model is what I call the purposeful leader. They're very clear about their purpose and the purpose of people around them, as we talked about, and, and how that whole thing connects. And they're, yes, they don't hesitate to be vulnerable. So my most frequently used phrase is, my name is Hubert and I need help, or I don't know. Um, and leaders can uh, role model this. So Cami, a head of HR at Best Buy, one day disclosed that for years she had suffered from depression. Who says this? As the leader of a Fortune 100 company, and you're supposed to be, you know, perfect and strong and so forth. But by doing this, she connected with the organization because she got hundreds of emails, people saying, "Oh my God, I've also so I know somebody, and I'm so glad you're better." And or somebody said, no, I'm struggling now. Do you have any advice for me? So all of a sudden, there's a human connection. And for me, one of the biggest dangers for leaders is to think that they need to be perfect. And one of the things I learned many years ago, but it's one thing to learn intellectually and then to practice it, is that the quest for perfection can be evil. All right? Uh, why, why do I say this? In, it's not that you don't want to perform, but there's a difference between performing as a business and trying to have perfect human beings. Here's the scoop. No human being is perfect, so that's the first thing. You're going to be working on teams. If you expect perfection from your team, you're going to be disappointed. And so you're going to hate your team members for being imperfect. And therefore, you're going to do all of, all of the work yourself, and it's going to be terrible. It's going to be disengaging. That's why we have this epidemic of disengagement in, in the corporate world where 80% of people are disengaged. Whereas uh, if you're clear about, you know, the, the, the things that, I mean, you let people see your most vulnerable points, your weaknesses. Like my example, I said, I, I'm trying to get better at this. That's one way to be authentic and vulnerable. Think, I'm not perfect. I need help. And it's from the team. Everybody's working on something that we can help each other. 
And that's how you build these genuine human connections because you can admire somebody who's perfect if there's such a person, you cannot love them. And if you don't accept your imperfections, you're not gonna love yourself and you're not gonna let others love you. And you're not gonna love others because they're imperfect. And so the longest journey I think we all have to make is the 18 inches from our head to our heart. And a big mistake I made for way too long during my professional life was to have my head cut off from the rest of my body. And so I love this quote from Khalil Gibran, the uh, Lebanese poet, who said, work is love made visible. And if you think about a company as a human organization, it's all about loving relationships amongst employees, between employees and customers, with partners. You, you try to develop win-win partnership with vendors, with the community in which you uh, operate and live. Because if the community is on fire, you know, there's no business to run. And then, and then your shareholders, because shareholders are there to provide for the retirement funds for so many of us. So we care about the shareholders too. And so that's the, um, that's the leadership model. And, and understand that every, every one of us has needs. And the most important need is the, 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 the need for genuine human connection and being seen and being respected and feel that we belong. Hubert, this is fantastic. This is this is an absolute masterclass in, in how leadership should be conducted, not, not only this year, but but moving forward. So, so many great examples that you brought out in the book. I, I would love to know, you, you mentioned about being authentic. And one of the things I love is, is using the saying, I don't know. I mean, that's okay in a leadership. I am wondering though, because so much of your career seemed like spectacular success after spectacular success. Was there a spectacular failure that, that you experienced throughout any of this? Yes. Absolutely. Here's one. Uh, if my share price goes down by 25 to 30% in one day, would that be a problem uh, for you, Tom? <laughs> this happened to me. You know? <laughs> so let me tell you that story. <laughs> it happened in January of 2014. So still relatively early in our turnaround story at Best Buy. During November, December of 2013, um, you know, we, before that, we had had five consecutive quarters of good performance, you know, early in our turnaround. But that November, December, things didn't go well. You know, arguably, the, the iPhone that year was not very strong. But frankly, we made mistakes. And so we missed our, ex our own expectations in terms of top line growth. In fact, we had revenue decline that quarter. First time since I had taken over. Ooh. And so... Um, so when we saw that, we knew the market would not react well, and we were right. Went down from $39. Now, it had gone from $11 to $39 in the preceding 12 months, but going from $39 to, I don't know, 27 or 28 in one day, it was not good. So the day before we announced, I gathered the officers of the company to share with them the news. They were expecting it because they're, they're you know, in leadership positions, but. Uh, uh, we had aggregated numbers. And uh, the, the question I said is, how, do, how are we going to deal with this? And we have a choice. We can either surrender and say, so we, we, you know, we failed and we go back home. And people who thought that Best Buy could not succeed were right. That was option A. Option B was, uh, so I love movies. So uh, I asked, why do we fall, Bruce? All right, that's a Batman movie. That's Batman Begin. And, and uh, Mr. Wayne says to young Bruce, so that we can learn to pick ourselves up. Uh, and then there's this great movie with Al Pacino, Any Given Sunday, where at halftime, Al Pacino is a coach, a football coach. He gives a speech to his team. Uh, everyone listening here should absolutely go listen to, which galvanizes the team. I say, so our choices, of course, we have to look at what went wrong, what mistakes did we make, self-included, not looking for you know, who's to blame, but so that we can learn. And then, so when we announced the next day, I told the investors, look, we made a few mistakes, we missed, we made a few mistakes, we're gonna learn from that, we're gonna pick ourselves up and we're gonna move forward. And as a leader, uh, so when things are going well, credit always goes to the frontliners. You know, you should never believe that, you know, you're the, the star. <laughs> and when things are not going well, take the blame. 
and not try to find somebody to blame, but say, this is it's under my watch. So let's study, let's learn, and let's move forward. And so as leaders, that's what we do. As leaders, we have to be a thermostat as opposed to a thermometer. Right. And so that for me, that was a so that was a big, a big moment, right? Minus 25 percent in one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can only imagine the, the difficulty, the magnitude of that moment. You, you did mention about viewing these as these growth opportunities, these learning opportunities. I, I, I just have to understand what it's like, though, when you go home, say you're sitting down to dinner that night. Like you have to have some serious inner turmoil, right? That, that's going on, even though you know this is going to be a really good growth and learning opportunity. How else do you wrestle with the, with the difficulty that I have to assume that scenario entitles? So yeah, yeah, there's a lot of introspection and, and working on self. So, you know, you, you start from a point of view that you're the product of your decisions, not of the circumstances. So you're, you're never blaming anybody. And you, 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 you work on knowing that as a leader, you need to always be upbeat and positive because you are a source of energy. People are gonna always look to you. And if you're, if you're walking, if, if when we were all in the office, if I would walk through the office and be down and depressed or angry, people would freak out. But if I'm upbeat and positive, it creates a huge impact. Now, it cannot be disingenuous. It cannot be, I don't see what's happening. It can be a can-do uh, attitude, uh, and that's our role as a leader. So there was another story. So maybe a year later, uh, the authorities told us that uh, they thought that we were, that was two weeks before Black Friday, Sean. So imagine this at Best Buy. Black Friday is really important, yeah. right? <laughs> they told us they thought we were the next breach, the next data breach. This would have been devastating. But that's what they were telling us. And so the next day I gathered, you know, we have a crisis response team. And my role to open the meeting was to say, look, nobody would dream to have a data breach, you know, just two weeks before Black Friday, right? That'd be, that'd be crazy, but here we have it. And I think this is gonna be an amazing leadership opportunity for all of us. Because based on how we deal with this, this will have consequences on hundreds of thousands of people, our employees, their family, the vendors, and I said, I couldn't be more excited and proud and to work with this team on working this challenge. So now let's get on with it, All right? We didn't decide that there was a data breach, but we could decide how we were gonna deal with it. And that's the mindset that as a leader, I, did, uh, you know, I encourage myself to have. Hubert, I absolutely love this. This is incredibly helpful, not only for myself, I know a ton of the listeners are, are gonna gain a lot out of this. Uh, I know we've got to wrap up here shortly. Uh, the Heart of Business, the, the book you've put so much time, effort, and energy towards. I would love for you to leave the listeners with, with any parting words here about the book. I know that they they just got a great insight into you, some of the frameworks. One, one of the things I love about the book, though, is you tied in stories, but then you also pose those reflection questions that we can use to dive deeper. And that that, that was, for me, just a huge uh, to take away and huge help. I would love any final words here just about the book, things you, you want the listeners to take away. Yeah, this book is really the philosophy behind the resurgence of, of Best Buy and behind you know, so much of what I've learned over the years. And this, this is this philosophy of you know, business being about pursuing a noble purpose, putting people at the center, creating an environment where everybody can blossom and treating profit as an outcome. And it's a, it's a view uh, of business that's easy to articulate, right? I just said it, really hard to do. And I've learned so much over the years from others and from doing that this is a book on, this is for leaders, anybody at any level who wants to lead from a place of purpose and humanity, is ready to let go of the paradigms of the past. And it's a guidebook, a playbook, a guide on how to do this and progress on this journey. And I think if we reinvent business around purpose and humanity, then I think we can create a, a more sustainable future where and of course, as employees, we're happier, we live a better life, but we can also, business can be a force for good and help address a lot of the severe issues that the world is facing, the environment, systemic racism, social inequity, a divided country. I think business can be a force for good. So for me, that's a, that's a guidebook. I've written it 
to help the next generation become the best version of themselves and learn how to uh, lead from a place of purpose and humanity. And, and if we do this, I, I am incredibly confident and hopeful that we can tackle a lot of these uh, problems and work together to create a better world. And Sean, we need this, right? What's the definition of madness? Doing the same thing that we've been doing and hoping for a different outcome. Whatever capitalism has been about has not been working. So we need something new and this book can be a blueprint for the next, it's leadership principles for the next era of capitalism that we've definitely entered. Yeah, one, one thing I would love to highlight there, Hubert, is around, we're, we're all leaders. It doesn't matter the position. And I think your story earlier uh, about the two Best Buy employees who, who resuscitated that dinosaur, um, I, I know that probably made their day better. The child's, the mother's, the, the vector and the impact that leads to uh, is, is tremendous. So yeah, the, the book is a tremendous help, a great guidebook um, exploring a lot of this. Final thing, Hubert, I, I would love to know, uh, I, I just love conversations like this. It's, it's one of the joys of my life. If you were going to sit down for an evening, having a long form conversation with someone dead or alive, just not a family member, who would you love just having a conversation with? Oh, no hesitation. Like probably many people, Winston Churchill, yeah. because he was a, uh, he was a great writer, Nobel Prize in literature. That's not bad. Uh, saved the world in 1940, frankly. A great painter. One of his paintings of Morocco just got, sold for $12 million. Uh, great inventor. He invented the tank. He invented the artificial harbors. And he was, uh, this, uh, at the same time, this flawed individual. You know, in The Finest Hour, the movie, uh, with Gary Oldman, you know, you can see how he doubted. He was not strong all the time. He was deeply flawed as a human being. And so bigger than life, so one of my world heroes, I may have one of the greatest collections of books written about Winston Churchill in the world. And I certainly have all of the books and speeches that he's ever written. So that's how crazy I am. <laughs> no, I love it. Winston Churchill, uh, for me, has, has been one of those, those pillars, those, those idols in, in terms of both the flaws and the positives. So it, it's always cool hearing another fan about that. But Hubert, this has been so much fun, uh, an absolute joy to continue and learn from you. I just can't thank you enough for coming on What Got You There. Thank you so much, John, and everyone have a great rest of the day and um, love the conversation. Good luck.